Welcome to Naked Reflections, brought to you from the Wolf Institute. I'm Ed Kessler, and each week I'll be taking an in-depth look at the stories reported by our friends over at The Naked Scientists. What does the latest scientific stuff mean for the rest of us? Stay with us and find out. I was their leader. I had to follow them. The 19th century politician and lawyer Alexandre Auguste Ledru Rollin coined that French aphorism at the height of the French Revolution of 1848. He was later forced into exile. We speak of natural leaders, inspirational leaders, even born leaders, but figuring out what leadership entails is complicated, even murky. In an earlier Naked Reflections discussion about the movement of peoples, the Danish anthropologist Pierre Schouten offered this rather gloomy observation. There's actually pretty solid archaeological evidence that much of human migration was also driven by the innate desire to escape aspiring overlords. Wherever people congregate, some people will be more equal than others. And throughout most of human history, the time-tested strategy has been to simply pick up and leave. Leadership is our subject this week. And we have two distinguished leaders, both lawyers, to discuss it. Professor Stephen Toop is the 346th Vice-Chancellor of the University of Cambridge. Not much precedent to call on there, then, Stephen. Among the other institutions he's headed up is the influential Monk School of Global Affairs at the University of Toronto. And Brenda Hale. Baroness Hale of Richmond, most recently President of the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom, famously declaring the Prime Minister Boris Johnson's suspension of Parliament unlawful. Brenda retired from the Supreme Court last year, and this court came into being a mere 800 years after the foundation of the University of Cambridge, and Brenda is only the third person and the first woman to have held the presidency. Well, welcome both. That was a somewhat bleak anthropological view from Pierre. When humans form groups, there's always someone trying to dominate it. Is that how you see it, Brenda? Well, I'm afraid I don't, because I think that's a very masculine point of view. And it is a well-known theory that women try and solve problems collectively, collaboratively, whereas men always seem to need there to be a pecking order. And... I don't think women feel quite that same necessity to know where they are in the pecking order, whether they're the top of the tree or the bottom of the tree. I wouldn't want to put too much on this because I feel sure it's necessary for women to get a grip and do some leadership. But I do think there is a a gender dimension to this whole question. Stephen, would you agree? I'm going to agree with Brenda, in fact, that I think there are many different ways of conceptualizing leadership. And and I don't think that this notion of there being dominance is necessarily uh, the correct way or and certainly not the exclusive way. So maybe I'm challenging Brenda and saying that even as a man, I could conclude that you don't have to be dominant to be a leader. I mean, if you think about conceptions of servant leadership that exist in many religious traditions, if you think about the philosophical pragmatists, Charles Pierce, John Dewey, they talked about exactly what Brenda described, which is how it is that we shape knowledge and we shape institutions through collaboration, not purely through domination. Although often that's the way it's said, Stephen, it's not always the way it's enacted. Uh, you think of primus inter pares, the first amongst equals, isn't always a sort of collaborative position, though. No? No, of course not. And and a lot of that has to do with individual personalities and cultural constructs. And I certainly understand why one might look at the world and think that dominance is the natural form of leadership. There are certainly a lot of people who behave that way, but I would simply want to assert that it's not the only way of thinking about it. And it's, in my view, not the best way of thinking. It's certainly not the way we thought about it uh, in the Supreme Court. But That's a rather specialist organisation, not unlike the Supreme Court of Canada, but it is a small group of people and the president of the court has a role in a certain amount of leadership, but the decision making is all of it collective and collaborative. And you can only get people to follow you 
if they agree with you or you can persuade them to agree with you or you set a good example that they feel they might want to follow. It's certainly not something where you can get your own way through domination. In fact, it's likely to be counterproductive. And yet, Brenda, I would only say that my experience in the university world, perhaps not surprisingly, is quite similar. The idea of a vice chancellor simply declaring something and imagining that anyone would follow is quite foreign to what really happens. Uh, You just described the need to encourage, the need to, in a sense, cajole, the need to persuade, the need to inspire, one hopes, uh, in order to attract people to a a position or, or a way of thinking. And I think universities really require that as well. Forgive me for being a cynic. And it's wonderful that both of you are in agreement, if only to disagree with my proposal at the beginning. But let me push back slightly, Stephen. You have 11,000 academics in the university and thousands of administrative staff, let alone 25,000 students. One of your predecessors once said to me, it wasn't so easy being a leader of 11,000 leaders. It's not as simple as that, is it? No, not at all. And that's exactly my point. There's a quite well-known joke that academics are independent contractors linked together only by a shared grievance over parking. And I think there's a lot of truth in uh, that, as there often is in humor. And what I mean by that is people within the universities do think of themselves as being very independent-minded and effectively running their own shows. And that's why if you're going to be a successful institution, you have to think about collaboration as the way forward, because you've got to bring all of those independent spirits along if you want to achieve anything that's collectively powerful. I think if you tried to imagine that you were going to come in as an incoming leader and reshape an organization like Cambridge University, you would just be uh, setting yourself up for disaster. I think you have to try to articulate as clearly as possible a way forward, options, visions, if you might put it that way, for the future. And then you have to work really hard to get out and talk with as many people as possible uh, to encourage people to sign on, in a sense, to that approach. But it's, it's always a question of listening to where other people want to go as well, because those 11,000 staff members are people who have really strong opinions about things, and they will not simply defer. But there are leaders who simply depend, in fact, their existence depends on the issuing of orders. You think of not just the military, but sports teams, for example. It is instructional in that way. And you need different skills, do you, to be a leader of a sports team, for example? Well, I would say probably the answer is yes. Uh, I guess the interesting question for me is which of these models is actually the more dominant model in the world? And I think we often imagine that the more dominant model is the military model or, as you put it, the sports model. I actually think they may be outliers in how human societies and organizations are actually shaped. Brenda, give us an illustration of how you would have managed a conflict situation in the court when you're with judges, whether it's just two judges, the three of you, a panel of three, or whether it's 12, and there is a fundamental divergence of opinion. What would you do as leader of the court? Well, one of the good things about our justice system is that people are free to disagree. So the majority wins. In the end, the person who is disagreeing knows that they are free to articulate that and go public with that disagreement if they want to. And I think that's probably one of the reasons why they so rarely do it. Because in the end, there is more usually that people have in common in their thinking than they disagree. It was 80%, I think, that we were unanimous in our decision making in the Supreme Court, which is a very high proportion when you think what a range of free-thinking, independent-minded spirits the justices of the Supreme Court are. So I, I think the ability to voice your disagreement is part of actually getting agreement. And to let people have their say. This is true of chairing any meeting, isn't it? Where it's a meeting of equals, where the leader is just leading this group. You let everybody have their say. And then you try and sum up what is the highest common factor rather than the lowest common denominator in what they are saying and say, well, is it like this? And you'll usually find that people will sign up to it, although they are free not to. 
if they really feel strongly about it. So it's letting everybody have their say and trying to synthesize something out of the collective view. And that's a really important skill, it seems to me, for effective leadership is being able to hear what people are saying and actually articulate it back to them in a coherent way that can involve others who may have somewhat different views. But as you say, there will be enough coalescence if you do that well to bring more people on board. That also applies to the interfaith endeavor as well, this ability to listen to one another. And that sort of real listening is a a trait that's not always so common as we'd like to think. I wonder, Stephen, if you could give us an example from the experience you had in in South Africa, because there you were as an observer to the first post-apartheid election. And there was a country absolutely riven, I suspect, and in a state of tumult. How was it that in this case, the leader, Nelson Mandela, pulled the country together. What skills did he show? I will say that Nelson Mandela is, to me, one of the great figures of the 20th century, uh, precisely because he was able to pull people together in an extraordinarily fractious situation. If I may very briefly give an anecdote, when I was uh, in South Africa for the elections, I was actually posted in the Orange Free State in uh, very small rural areas. And there was a lot of worry about violence. There was a sense in which, uh, you know, frankly, a lot of the Boer farmers might not be willing to engage age in this political transition. And one of the most moving moments for me in that whole experience was very early on the election day, I was already at a a rural poll and I saw a white farmer driving up with a truck and all of, or many of the farm laborers who worked on his farm were in the back of that truck and he was driving them to the polling station. And I thought there's something extraordinary happening here, if that is one of the first images that I've been given to. But I would say that, you know, for Mandela, it was the generosity of spirit and the sense of forgiveness that, to me, was probably his most powerful traits. And I have to say they're deeply needed in our world. I I think there's precious little forgiving uh, going on the way our uh, social media works. There's just a lot of anger, there's rage, and that's validated consistently. And so seeing someone like Mandela, who was genuinely inclusive, even of people who were his own oppressors, is symbolically extraordinary. And, uh, you know, you can't expect everyone to have that degree of generosity of spirit, but a little hint of it would be pretty good for all of us. So compassion, if you like, is one aspect of leadership that we need. If we move it on to the question of religious leadership, you get a whole array of different types of leaders and religious leaders vary enormously. And and they've changed, of course, over, over the decades, let alone over hundreds of years. So what skills do you think are needed by those people who stand up in the pulpit on a Friday, a Saturday or a Sunday to bring their community with them? Because sometimes they're going to be preaching to the community a lesson that the community doesn't really want to hear, Brenda. Well, I think if you take Christianity, which is the religion I know most about, seriously, uh, most people wouldn't want to be there. I think one of the tricks, I don't mean that pejoratively, the word trick, for uh, a good preacher is to know their audience. And so it is much easier in a smaller congregation or a religious community with which you're quite familiar, because then you'll know what sort of jokes you can tell, because you have to have at least one joke in each sermon, preferably two or three. You also have to have a good structure. Three points is quite good, but you have to know how literary you can be and how theological you can be. Or do you just have to be a great rah-rah, tub-thumping, bring on the troops to fight the good fight sort of thing? You have to know your audience. And I think that's true of all public speaking. So we can have quite a cerebral sermon from the preacher. Whereas if, even if you're a bishop uh, preaching a sermon on Easter Sunday to a fairly traditional congregation in St. Mary's Church in Richmond, well, then you have to have a slightly different style. I love watching (laughs) the the different styles of successful preachers (laughs) because there's an awful lot you can learn from them. 
Well, I mean, I agree with Brenda's observations about, you know, some of the the skills in a sense around leadership through preaching or leadership through public speaking. But I also think that increasingly there's a demand that leaders are authentic to themselves as well. I think if people feel that someone is completely recasting herself just to make a particular point in a certain circumstance, that will come across as potentially inauthentic. So I do think authenticity, being yourself, even as you are paying close attention to your audience, is sort of the inverse skill that is also very much required. And I think the other piece I would emphasize is integrity, which seems obvious, but I think people get really frustrated with leaders who don't seem to uh, have an integrity uh, in what they say and do. Now, of course, there are many examples to the contrary in our world, and we may come on to that. But I think at the end of the day, mixing authenticity and integrity is really very important for successful and, frankly, admirable leadership. You're listening to Naked Reflections with me, Ed Kessler, and my two guests, Stephen Toop and Brenda Hale. We're discussing leadership, putting to one side the contentious subjects of how IQ tests actually work. It seems that possessing high intelligence, however you measure it, does not necessarily confer strong leadership qualities. Here's an extract from an essay by Isabel Cochrane on the Naked Scientist website. What's in an IQ score? IQ appears to be only a small piece of the puzzle. For instance, emotional intelligence appears to have an important role to play in the effectiveness of domestic leadership. Somewhat akin to social intelligence, emotional intelligence is a measure of one's ability to recognise and respond appropriately to emotion, using this awareness to guide one's thinking and decisions. Others have suggested that even more nebulous measures, such as cultural intelligence, are particularly important for modern leadership. So let's move on to that question of intelligence. And highly intelligent people do not necessarily make great leaders. Stephen, you've come across many highly intelligent people and many who don't make good leaders. Absolutely. I think the two are not integrally related. I think, you know, having intelligence is helpful. There's no doubt about that. And I would never gainsay it. But I don't think it's sufficient for strong leadership. In fact, I've thought about this in my my own personal circumstances, because I was once in an institution, I won't say where or with whom, where I felt that the leader was one of the smartest people I had ever worked with. And I I liked the person, got on with uh, the person extremely well. But I always felt felt that uh, he misjudged character and made bad appointments because he privileged intelligence above every other skill. And I think uh, the reality is one needs an ability to inspire and communicate. I think I mentioned integrity. I would add modesty, I think, helps a form of modesty uh, in leaders and having clear goals and being able to delegate uh, to other people. So there are skills, there are values, there are uh, ways of imagining purpose that aren't directly related to intelligence. Now, none of us are spring chickens, and that won't be a surprise to our our listeners, but everything seems to have been exacerbated by social media, by the internet. We hear a great deal of this. Help us navigate the impact, as you see it, of the wider media. I'm going to start with you, Brenda, because, of course, the famous court case that I touched on in the introduction was followed by millions of people live, as it were, uh, with people tweeting. And did you try and cut yourself off from that altogether? Were you influenced, not in your judgment, but perhaps in the way that you presented your judgment? Well, I don't know a senior judge who does social media. We're advised in our code of conduct to be very cautious about it and to be aware of all the pitfalls and dangers. And certainly I have never engaged Uh, Even in the private little networks, I have never done that. And I am glad of that because I think it does mean that you can step back and just be aware, of course, that there is a debate raging outside. But there's enough rage going on in the um, conventional media without one going into the more modern media to know what the parameters of the debate are. And that, that you do have to know and be aware of. Because clearly it's important that anything that goes on in the courts is 
properly. Well, it won't ever be completely understood by the public. That's not not fair. But properly explained in the way that we go about explaining so that we are aware of how people are thinking and how we need to try and pitch our explanations. That's part of our accountability to the public. So to that extent, yes, aware. But it wouldn't have affected what the decision was because, of course, the decision is guided by what the law is and what the principles of law is. And even if everybody in the country thought those principles were wrong, we would still have to uphold them. So in point of fact, Brenda, what you're saying is that the raging noise, if you like, around a court case has to be put to one side altogether. And its only influence on you and your, your fellow judges is how you present your findings. I may be oversimplifying, but I think that's right. As a qualification of what I said earlier, if the whole world thought that a particular legal principle was wrong, we might have to ask ourselves, well, is that in fact what the legal principle drives us to decide? Or uh, are there nuances or twitches or developments that could mean that we can articulate it in a way which Com- commands a greater degree of public acceptance than the previous situation did. And Stephen, your position, of course, is hugely influenced by nuance, by the way things are presented. You have a communications office t- to help you. But nevertheless, it doesn't take much before some part of the University of Cambridge is pulled into the public domain in a pretty intense and controversial way. Absolutely. That is one of the hardest parts of this job. And it's a particularly powerful uh, difficulty at Cambridge because of the prominence of the institution, especially in the UK psyche. Things that happen here and things that happen at Oxford are always heightened in the media. You know, I was reading a study the other day, which was done by some uh, European researchers, a consortium, which revealed, and it was a very rigorous study, that In order to be retweeted in anything that had a political content, you are much, much more likely to be successful if you say something negative. And that tells us a lot, unfortunately, about the way I think um, our social media tends to work, that the more negative, the harsher, and frankly, sometimes even the more misleading you can be, the more likely that will get picked up. And this isn't just about Cambridge, this is about uh, institutions and individuals. The inverse of that, I have to say, is that sometimes uh, colleagues of of mine within the institution tweet things that are... uh, you know, pretty offensive in some ways, and it's their right to do that, I suppose. But then the university ends up having to defend people uh, for things that aren't really core to the academic mission at all. So there's a lot of noise in the system as a result of social media. And uh, I think people have a lot of trouble uh, factoring that out in decision making. But isn't that part of the human condition, Stephen, to a certain extent, we're not interested in the 999 planes that land safely. I mean, in pre-COVID times, we're interested in the one that crashes. We're interested in where there is a conflict. We're not so interested where people just rub along nicely. I think it probably is a, an element of the human condition. I think the the thing that we have to be careful about is not to then overvalue it in decision. I've got a great colleague, you'll know David Spiegelhalter, who's really careful about these things. So, you know, your plane example is a perfect one. We focus so much energy on that when, in fact, the reality is you're way, way much more likely to be killed walking across the street near your house than, than in a plane crash. And the point is, we should be careful about traffic. We should be looking at intersections. We should be looking at crosswalks. And it matters from a public policy and spending point of view. So my point is not that you know we everyone should be happy and get along and not criticize. But my point is, let's make sure that we don't get the balance so off that our public policy is destroyed. I would agree with that. And I would also think that one of the great upholders of a more balanced view of society and community used to be local newspapers. Our local newspaper up here in North Yorkshire still is probably fuller of good news stories than it is of bad news stories. 
and it makes you feel good about the place. There are some bad news stories, of course, and they, they do print those, but they're still telling us the good news about what people in the community have done. And so that's why I agree it's a question of balance. You need to put out the good news as well as the bad news. But whenever I look at the comments underneath an article in a newspaper, which I read online, didn't used to read newspapers online, but I do now, I am horrified by, on the whole, the vitriol and the ignorance and the failure really to take on board what the other commentators are saying as they go through, through this. And that's not what debate is about. That's not what discussion is about. And so I try not to look at it, really. <laughs> I think that's very wise, Brenda. We're coming towards the end, and I'd like you each to nominate somebody, alive or dead, who you admire for their leadership skills? Oh, well, there are so very, very many. Uh, it's difficult to pick anyone out. If I was picking somebody out in the legal sphere, I would pick out the great Lord Bingham, who was senior law lord from 2000 to 2008 when he had to retire. And he had had all the leadership roles in the legal system of England and Wales and then the United Kingdom. And he was great both in his personal qualities and in his legal qualities. But there are loads of other people who've achieved a huge amount without being the Churchills of this world. And I think the other one I would pick out as a great post-war leader is Clement Attlee. How did somebody like Clement Attlee manage to achieve, firstly, the landslide victory in the 45 election, but then the welfare state? which he did. And so it's not always the obvious people who are the greatest achievers uh, in this world. Well, I'm going to be, I'm afraid, much less creative. I agree, uh, by the way, that th there are hundreds, thousands, probably tens of thousands of people that one could choose. But I'm going to single out someone who has been a very famous leader, and that's Barack Obama. And the reason I'm picking him is because I think he is an extraordinarily rare example of a hugely successful political leader who has a high degree of self-understanding. Uh, I've read uh, many of uh, the pieces that he's written, most notably, I still think, Dreams of My Father, which I found an astonishing piece of writing for a person at the time in his career. But the, the self-revelation and the acceptance of one's own complexity and, to your earlier point, failures as a leader as well as successes, I just think he's quite unique in that and I, and I admire it greatly. I think we need a female leader. It feels very male heavy at the moment. Who is there either of you would, would nominate in terms of a, a female leader? And as you said, Brenda, it doesn't have to be somebody who is a, a world renowned political figure, but somebody who stands out as a, a model for the, particularly for the female listeners we have. Well, I mentioned two names, one of which is Eleanor Roosevelt, who basically achieved the Universal Declaration of Human Rights which is still one of the most remarkable documents that any political process has produced. That's one very high profile. People have always heard of her. But we could also think of Shirley Williams, who was the best prime minister we never had, in, in my view. And uh, two remarkable women amongst, of course, many who haven't had the prominence that they deserve until recently, but we're working on it and we're doing quite well. Unfortunately, I have to lead this discussion to a close. Thank you for listening and a special thank you to our two guests, Stephen Toop and Brenda Hale. Do contact us at Naked Reflections. You can find us at the Wolf Institute, send an email or on Facebook or even Twitter. Let us know what you think of the show and if you've got suggestions, let us know. We've covered a wide range of subjects which you can find by delving into our back catalogue. And you can also find the Naked Reflections podcast at nakedscientist.com slash reflections or wherever you get your podcasts. I'll be back next week with some more guests. <laughs>